So welcome everybody. Thanks for joining uh, Representative Merwicki and myself for our second monthly uh, check-in with constituents. We're gonna each give a short update about things we've been working on in the legislature. And then we have a presentation coming from uh, Representative Partridge re uh, regarding her work on the Agriculture Committee. And then we'll have some time for announcements and question and answers uh, from all of you. So um, I'm still just getting my feet wet as a legislator legislator. I've been in, I think at this point, six weeks. I'm serving on the Corrections and Institutions Committee. And I'm finding that there's a really wide range of issues that we're looking at in that committee. Um, some of them are related to, as you'd expect, uh, reforms uh, and policy related to the correction system. But on the institution side of my committee, we look at all kinds of issues related to the governor's uh, capital budget which includes things like large amounts of funding for the Vermont Conservation Housing Board, which includes both low-income housing and conservation projects like uh, trails in the Northeast Kingdom. Um, we've provided funding for things, or we're looking to provide funding for things like clean water projects. Um, and uh, a new thing that we just actually voted out yesterday uh, to send to the Appropriations Committee was dealing with starting a revolving loan fund to increase energy efficiency projects around the state. So we're looking to put $5 million into a fund which will be paid back through savings in energy efficiency with projects that will be uh, implemented all over the state by local municipalities. So there's a really, really wide range of things that we're working on. Uh, we also collectively uh, on the floor voted, um, I believe it was just this past week to pass H81 which was related to increasing options for collective bargaining for the lowest paid workers in our school system, which I think more than any other issue, I received an awful lot of constituent feedback about and support for, and we actually passed that uh, bill by a very large margin. So um, I think that's as much as I need to touch in on on my initial uh, run through. Oh, one last thing. Um, I have also been busy uh, working with one of my constituents who's on the call today, uh, Jeanette Staley. Uh, she contacted me a few weeks back with some concerns about racial equity issues in our state. Some uh, concerns about in our state how some women of color have stepped down from elective office because of pressures related to discrimination and a whole lot of other things that are really uh, not the way we want our state to be. And so we've been putting our heads together about what maybe could we do about this. And I actually did some follow up looking at if it made sense to introduce some uh, hate speech legislation. And it doesn't look like that probably is going to go forward this year. But um, Jeanette and I are looking to form an exploratory committee to dive deeper into some of these issues in our region and see what we can do about that. And I'll let her speak to that a little bit more um, after these other uh, presentations. So. Thanks everybody for coming. And um, Mike, I'll hand it over to you to give your update. Well, thanks Michelle. And thanks to everyone for, for coming on, on a Saturday morning. It is wonderful to see familiar faces. Um, and I also wanna thank Michelle uh, for her work right now. She has jumped in with both feet. Uh, I think she's doing great work already. Uh, the committee she's on, uh, has a lot more to it than I think most people uh, understand. But along with that, there are 25 different committees in the House and Senate. And we have to be aware of what they're all doing. And that's why it makes a, uh, it's just essential that we all have to work together. And I really appreciate uh, the way Michelle has been working together with me and with the rest of the, the caucus. And, and uh, I think as we, as we move on, uh, we're, we're creating a, a good team for, for the people of the Wyndham Ford District. Uh, I'll, I want to recognize, too, we, we do have a guest uh, that I'll introduce in a little bit, Representative Carolyn Partridge, but her district mate just north of us, Representative Leslie Goldman, is here, too. So I want to thank them. And they add to the county delegation we have, and we, we have a really great group that works together. And I just want to note, I think, uh, this is the shape of the future to come, I hope, in politics. And, and what I mean is we've been trying to press towards gender equality. And right now, our county delegation has 14 legislators and 11 of them are women. 
So we are we are moving in that direction. I see Eva clapping her hands there. <laughs> so uh, I just want to share that um, it's good to see everybody, and I'm hoping there's somebody out there that I I would ask to make sure we're all muted, because it sounds like somebody's typing away on a keyboard. So. Here we are, late February. This is the time of year when uh, I start to get a little antsy. Cabin fever sets in, get tired of those long, dark, cold nights, and COVID hasn't made it any easier. But then we start to see the days get a little longer, and that feels good. And I'm going to be starting some seeds for the garden this weekend, and that feels encouraging. And and pretty soon we'll see the sugar houses with steam rising up out of them. And these are all good signs of spring. So hope is coming. Now at the start of this legislative session, uh, we heard from our state economist and he made a presentation where he emphasized the, the connection between our physical health and the health of our economy. And that in countries that have successfully managed COVID, um, not only are the people healthier, but their economies are healthier and they haven't had the kind of suffering we've seen in parts of this country. Now, Vermont has done a lot better than most states. Uh, and that's, that's a tribute to, to all of you. Vermonters have, have followed, the, followed the science, followed the recommendations, and, and we're doing a lot better than other states. And I will uh, say right now that happily I registered to get my shot today. Now. It's not my time yet, but what they're recommending is before your time to get registered in the system. And that'll make it, it go a lot easier when it's your time to, to get your, your vaccination. Um, now this legislature has gotten right off to a flying start and we're, we're actually trying to push things a little faster, especially around the budget. And the reason for that is our anticipation is that uh, in March, we'll get another round of stimulus funds from Washington. And then what happens is every committee in the legislature starts to look and see where the needs are. And then we discern you know, how we can best use that stimulus money so it does, does the most good. Um, I also wanna recognize at this time, all the people in our communities that have helped make things, keep things going from teachers to medical staff to the people at our grocery stores. There's a lot of heroes out there and I wanna salute them. Now, <clears throat> at the start of the session, COVID was the big thing. It still is, but we're working to that point where COVID is gonna to start to recede. And these other big issues though, like climate, racial and social justice are still gonna be clouds on our horizon. <clears throat> after COVID recedes. So we're doing a lot of work in those areas. Agriculture is tied into a lot of that too. Now, just before we, we came on, our, our guest representative, Carl and Partridge, was sharing a little bit about how much our forest land helps offset our carbon. And she can talk a little bit about that, but not only is agriculture 30% of our economy, but moving forward, it's an essential part of, of our the battle against climate change. And so um, I wanna thank Carolyn for taking some time on this Saturday morning. And right now I'll pass it on to you to share a little bit as, of your work as chair of the, of the House Agricultural Committee. Thanks, Carolyn. Well, thanks, Mike. Uh, and what a pleasure to be here and see so many familiar faces. And um, <clears throat> I, I don't exactly know where to start, but I, I think what I will do is uh, start with one of the um, very special things that has been released in the last week or two. And uh, it is the Vermont Agriculture and Food System Strategic Plan for 2021 to 2030. So this is available online if you go to the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund uh, website. I think it's vsjf.org. Uh, and you can get the entire, it's a, over 200 pages. And <clears throat> the agriculture, uh, and I chair agriculture and forestry in the Senate, it's just agriculture. But a year or two ago, we tasked the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets uh, in conjunction with the Vermont Sustainable Jobs Fund to come up with 
uh, a plan, a strategic plan for the future. We know that dairy farming has really suffered some hits with low milk prices. It is uh, struggling greatly, but it is our anchor market. And what I mean by that is, you know, it brings in $3 million a day to the state. Uh, it's huge, but it also keeps many of the infrastructure folks afloat. So uh, grain dealers, seed dealers, equipment dealers, they're here because of, of dairy essentially. And so those of us, I, I'm a small sheep farmer, uh, when it used to be that if our baler went down and we were in the hay field, I could drive over to Walpole, New Hampshire to R.N. Johnson and get parts. And then uh, they went out of business. And then I had to drive to Keene, which is an hour away, uh, to Keats. And Keats closed. And now, if we have an, a piece of equipment go down, I have to drive either to Randolph or to Middlebury. Both of them are an hour and three quarters away. So that's a real challenge. And we've seen, I, I think when I started in the legislature, which was 23 years ago, there were probably over 2,000 dairy farms, and we are now down to 650, roughly. So that is of great concern. Uh, what, what this strategic plan does, and I really, if you're interested in all, I, 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 and I can talk the ears of a brass monkey when it comes to agriculture. So, you know, some of you might not care at all, but I think um, food is so important to us and creating a sustainable plan is really good. And, and having this document helps us analyze or assess anything that comes before us regarding the future. So there are product briefs here going from agroforestry to swine. Uh, there are market briefs, there are issue briefs, and anybody who watches, I, I do have a website, carolynpartridge.com. I also write an article that generally appears now in the Brattleboro Reformer on Tuesdays. Um, but this is just a wealth of information uh, for anybody who is, who is interested. Um, we also are excited because, I, or I'm excited because I can see the tie-in between climate change, cleanup of the lake, Lake Champlain, uh, which I see David Dean is here and he had such such an important role in crafting the language that became our TMDL, which is total maximum daily load, uh, and is basically the plan to clean up the lake. Uh, I'm excited because agriculture is a strong part of that. We know that based on the report card this year, 96% of the phosphorus reduction, which is what's important for, um, for Lake Champlain, uh, Lake Mimpromagog, is phosphorus and um, agriculture is responsible for a lot of the mess, like 41% of the mess is because of agriculture. And we are taking on 68% of the cleanup uh, and that's working. Why, why is that the case? Because it's so much more cost effective to remediate ag land than it is uh, developed land and things like wastewater treatment systems. So. In the last report, the report card just released recently, agriculture is, um, is giving credit for 96% of the clean, uh, the reduction of phosphorus in Lake Champlain. Um, I think somebody's not muted. Um, I, hear, I hear background noise. Um, and, and last year, uh, they were giving credit for 97% of the phosphorus reduction. So that's exciting. Part of that reduction has to do with the adoption of regenerative agriculture, soil health principles. And uh, Heather Darby, who is a um, PhD agronomist at the UVM Extension has given several really great presentations regarding uh, the importance of this and how cover cropping, for instance, some of the, some of the techniques are cover cropping and low-till, no-till, leaving roots in the soil, um, keep uh, using grass waterways, things like that, so that we do not have as much runoff has been critical to this whole thing. 
Uh, and one of the really exciting things that Heather told us, um, I, I don't know if you ever get a chance to check out any of Heather Darby's work, I suggest you do. She is, she is a, uh, she's a farmer, first of all, but she's also got her PhD and, she, and she's done incredible work with farmers all around the state, in particular the Northwest. Uh, she lives in Alberg, but um, she was telling us that, uh, well, I'll give, you a, I'll give you a little fact that we know that if, if we can increase the organic matter in soil um, by 1% in the top six inches of toy, topsoil, we can increase the amount of water, rainwater uh, that is held by an acre by 27,000 gallons. Now, that's really important because we know that our extreme precipitation events have increased by 78% over the last 50 years. And you've all experienced that with, with Tropical Storm Irene and, and other events. And it will also, if you create a sponge, you create good soil health, you create a sponge that will then also slowly release moisture, which uh, helps with drought. So, so it creates a real resiliency for our, our land if we can increase organic matter in our soil. So interestingly, at a meeting on January 20th, Heather visited with us and told us that the state average for organic matter in the soil is 5.6. And nationally, it's 3.2%. So we are way ahead of the game in terms of organic matter in, so in our soil. And it's estimated that if we can increase, improve that organic matter by 0.4%, bringing it up to six, in the top 30 centimeters, which is about 12 inches of, of soil, uh, we could sequester over 98,000 metric tons of CO2 per year. So these are, these are the things that really excite me um, because not only uh, is it good for our soil and potentially water quality, but it also helps feed us. So the question is now the next thing we're looking at, and this coming Thursday, uh, I'm going to be co-chairing a meeting. It's a, a webinar on the Council of State Governments Eastern Regional Conference site that is about creating a regional food system. We saw uh, as a result of the pandemic, the cracks that have been revealed in our food supply system. And I, I never thought I'd see the day when I go to the supermarket and see there was no pasta on the shelves and bean, you know, the beans, not to mention the toilet paper, but meat, you know. Um, and so how could we, this is the question we're asking ourselves in our committee, how could we create a regional food supply chain system so that we could number, number one, feed ourselves better. We could keep our money here in the Northeast region instead of spending it on um, produce from California or Chile. And you know, th there are plenty of challenges involved. I'm not saying that this is gonna be easy, but how can we do that and also reduce our carbon footprint by not having to transport all of these goods from long distances. So, so these, this is why I'm excited about agriculture, why I love chairing my committee, which is also forestry. And Mike mentioned the emissions um, off, offset. In terms of both, we're looking at ways to reimburse our farmers for their good work, for their good practices. So we're looking at payment for ecosystem services, which applies to both agriculture and forestry. Uh, we have a, a committee working on that. It's an extracurricular activity headed by folks at the Agency of Agriculture, Food and Markets, and they are making progress. We've had some struggles trying to fund their, their work. Uh, it just, it, it doesn't require much, but it does require some staffing and notification and what have you. Um, but at any rate, I think that we're going to be able to find the money, hopefully in this year's budget to, to continue that work. 
So I've sort of rambled on now for a while and I'd be interested in any questions uh, or if you have anything in particular regarding anything, the things I've said or maybe some things I haven't said. Yeah. Eva, did you have a question? Um, explain to me when we're talking about cover crop, am I clear that what I read was in the cover crop is uh, chemicals that are, are uh, not good for the soil because it keeps weeds down among the cover crop. Am I making this up or did I read this? Um, I'm not sure I know exactly what you're saying, Eva. Um, it, it, cover cropping does require the use of glyphosate. And that is, that is controversial, uh, but it is one, it, but evidence shows real data, scientific data show that in fact, the use of glyphosate has decreased uh, over the last while. And um, I know that there is, there is one person out giving presentations indicating the opposite. But um, I, would, I would ask you to look to uh, a, a blog actually that Terry Bradshaw, who is a UVM extension person, you may know him because he works, he's worked for years in uh, the Apple industry. But uh, I'll, let me see, I'll try and find that. Uh, I think it's blog.uvm. Yes, blog.uvm.edu. He really, it kind of counters some of the, um, the, I would say, poor science that is being okay. uh, spread and actually reported on by VPR. Okay, well, thank you, Carolyn. The other thing is, I'm so grateful for the good work you've done forever. And I read your articles on the Reformer, and I appreciate that. But uh, when it comes to, to dairy farms, my heart doesn't break the way it used to about the dairy farms going under. When I see the ones that go organic are thriving, the ones that go organic are thriving. And I'd like to see your committee and the agriculture department support going organic because organic is selling. It's selling. Yeah, but, and that is, um, that is also, I, I, I agree with you. It's good. There are uh, organic dairy farmers who have done very well. However, it's not the panacea for the situation. Um, there is money actually that helps farmers transition, but my, the vice chair of my committee, Rodney Graham from Williamstown, just recently last May actually sold his cows. He was a uh, grass-fed organic dairy farmer. And because of the pandemic and other factors, he, um, you know, all of a sudden, the, the organic milk producers <clears throat> or the co-op was reducing the amount of milk that they were buying. Uh, the great thing about, I will, I totally agree with you in that organic um, dairy is basically done on a supply management system, which is what Canada does. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and, and that's good. Uh, because farmers, conventional farmers in, in Canada are doing much better than our conventional farmers. However, it's not the, it's not the answer to everything. Rodney, unfortunately, uh, due to the abundance of organic milk, uh, they wouldn't pick up his milk. And that's what they do. They start finding reasons not to pick up your milk. And he ended up having to sell his, his cows. And it was, it was very sad. Um, Rodney is... Um, a, a crusty kind of guy, but he was, he, it just killed him because his family, you know, the family, he's like probably third or fourth generation farmer on his farm. Now the good, here's the good news. There's a, uh, and I want to get this out to the general public too. There is a, a Vermont Housing and Conservation Board has a farm and forest viability program which I, if any farmer is listening and needs help, I highly recommend that you you contact VHCB. You can Google them, it's easy. Um, but they have been helping farmers transition from dairy to other 
uh, other forms of agriculture, diversified agriculture, they offer business planning. They'll help you create a business plan. And I can't tell you the number of folks who have testified in my committee saying how helpful it was. They help people with the COVID money, apply for COVID money, um, which I did too. I actually got help from somebody at the agency of ag, but they helped numerous people apply for those grants. It was not totally easy. And for some of some of the older farmers, uh, it was a real challenge because it was all done online. So, um, so I highly recommend anybody you know who needs help looking to the Farm and Forest Viability Program. Okay, um, but another, I'm, I'm going to interrupt one other thing. Mike, Eva, just give me Eva, that. we have what? some other people that have some questions, okay. Eva. So if we we can okay. get some other people to get some questions, and also if you have a question, you can also put it in the chat. Okay. So uh, Jody Normando, I think, has her hand up. Go for it. Hi, Carolyn. Hi, Jody. Good to see you. Good to see you. I haven't seen you forever. <laughs> um, what I'm having a couple of issues is with the forestry program. First of all, um, when you when you log, uh, invasives come in, and so um, like. I'm, I'm hesitant to even log because the invasives just take over when you log. That was one issue. The other issue is the uh, timbering or logging for the pellet boilers and taking out some, so much of the forest. And I don't know if your committee handles either one of those cases. Well, Jody, I'm not aware of logging, bringing invasives in. I think uh, many, you may be right, and I will talk to Mike Snyder, who's the Commissioner of Forests, Parks, and, Parks and Recreation. Um, but many of the uh, invasives have just gotten here because they've gotten here. You know, they're, we don't have big high gates up around the state or walls, thank goodness, um, but they, they come. And, um, and so I'm not really aware of that. Uh, do you have land in current use? Yes, we do, and and but also the neighbors um, when they logged and opened it up immediately, the stuff came in, and we're constantly fighting invasives um, in certain areas. Oh, do you mean invasive invasive plants or invasive pests? Plants. Oh, okay. Boy, I am not aware of that. I'll I would, but I'll happy. I'm happy to take that to Commissioner Snyder, and um and and ask him that question. Let me just jot this down or I'll, I could potentially forget. And what was the second part of your question? The second part is pellet boilers are getting so popular, particularly for schools and things like that. Yep. And from what I've read, they take a whole, you know, they just kind of clear cut. And I'm worried about it's happening in Vermont. Well, in order to clear cut more than 40 acres, you have to have a special permit as, I, as far as I remember. And I'd ask David Dean or anybody who knows this to jump in. Um, it's actually um, one of those uses for low grade wood that um, is, is potentially helping our folks combat the fact that five of the mills in Maine for low grade uh, wood have closed. And so, but, but there is a very cool, the Vermont uh, Pellet Company, I think that's the actual name, uh, Chris Brooks is the owner. Uh, they have a whole business model that where they don't want any of these plants closer than that 30 mile radius so that we don't deplete the forests in any one place. Um, I think that that is right now the, the only really successful pellet company at this point. But um, I'm also not aware that there's a depletion. In fact, I think that there's a real need for um, for markets for our low grade wood, but I will check with on that as well. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Tony Elliott, did you have a question? Well, you know, given time, all my questions get answered. <laughs> I, uh, I, I think Eva's question about organic farming is good. Uh, a while back, we had a, uh, the whole herd buyout program in Vermont to help farmers in the dairy business uh, get into alternate businesses. I wonder, and, and I think Carolyn did speak of funds available to help farmers uh, change 
their uh, livestock and that sort of thing. I think that's an important thing, and I'll just leave that as a comment. Uh, you know, shifting over to uh, sheep or goats or some other uh, form of livestock. Uh, I think, though, we should be so supporting organic dairy, uh, especially uh, goat's milk, which is very hard to get in Vermont. And um, so comment there for, for the agriculture side. Thank you. Well, you know, it's interesting, uh, Tony, one of the things that came out of this um, strategic plan last year, the, last year, the, the, the agency and uh, farm, Vermont's the Sustainable Jobs Fund and Farm to Plate are basically the same thing. Um, I, I mean, Farm to Plate is part of uh, VSJF. But what they, what they discovered is that based on the, the needs for our cheesemakers, our very successful uh, Vermont Creamery, uh, we need 4,000 more goats in the state to, to, to supply the need for the, to, to create the cheese that's being produced. Right now, they're going to, uh, I think, potentially New York, Quebec, maybe New Hampshire to, to fulfill the need. So we do need that. Um, and I will say, years ago, when I lived up on Hartley Hill in Westminster, I always say I lived in Sacton's River because that was my community, but um, I did milk goats and milk goats for years until my kids grew up and we just didn't use as much milk. But goat's milk is wonderful. And I attribute the fact that they do not have allergies and I'm not making any claims here, FDA, but um, I, I attribute the fact that they do not have allergies. And I lost my pal pollen allergy when I started drinking goat's milk myself. So um, I think goat's milk is fabulous and highly supported. We've, we've had milk allergies in the family as well as other allergies. And I support that. It, the milk allergies don't exist in goat's milk for us. And my other allergies have gone away. So yeah. maybe. <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. from a practical I, standpoint too, I found it was a lot, it's a lot easier to milk a goat than a cow. And as they say, it hurts a lot less when you get stepped on by a goat than a cow. So true, so true, Mike. You know, another story, I a family in Saxons River who I was very good friends with, Sean and Joan Campbell. Uh, when their son was born, for some reason he found, um, he couldn't even have, I think it was breast milk. And, um, and I brought some goat's milk down to her. Don't tell anybody, okay? Um, it's years ago and he did survive, but it was unpasteurized and he did fine with it. So um, yeah, I think goat's milk is wonderful. No, thanks. Now, um, Ruby McAdoo, are you still there? I yep, saw you. Yep. Had... I'm here. Hey, Ruby. Hi. So, Ruby, it makes me a... think of summer. <laughs> hey, Ruby, you have a question? I do. Um, and it's, it's not related to this, although I think goat milk is amazing as well. Um, so my name is Ruby McAdoo. I'm from Putney. Um, I'm a parent uh, at, of two kids at PCS. I'm on the um, I'm the chair of the PCS Leadership Council, um, and our district is um, our towns are facing a vote that affects our district, as everybody I think knows about withdrawal from our um, merged WSESD. And I think there's a similar such vote in Westminster related to affecting the Westminster school as well. I, I'm, I, I sent a little message to Mike because I saw a, um, an article or a commentary in the reformer today um, printed by Mad Maggie Cassidy that referenced H180, which seems to be some kind of draft legislation that is in the education committee that's considering um, law that would be relevant to allowing um, forced mergers like ours to um, make a decision like we're, we're, we're making. But I guess I wanted to ask about it because I'm confused. I've heard, I, I don't feel like I'm the most well-versed in what's going on up in Montpelier, but I have heard through a, a lot of information that I'm wondering if it's misinformation that there's nothing 
pending that's relevant to like that the legislature is not considering this. This isn't the time for um, us to be thinking about this. Don't worry about it. There's nothing on the table. That's what, kind of what I'd heard. And then this um, being in the paper made me think, wait, what is going on? <laughs> so I figured I would ask you guys since you know you guys know better than I do. Mike, do you want me to answer this a little bit? Um, you could, and then it's the bill she's talking about is something I've co-sponsored, so I can follow up. But if you want to share your piece, since this is uh, certainly relevant to Wyndham, your town. Yes, and and um, as some of you know, Jody knows and Paul knows that I fought. I mean, yes, I did vote for Act 46 because they allowed for off ramps, which I think the Agency of Education essentially ignored. And I know this because I wrote the an alternative governance structure proposal for Wyndham and felt like I was not taken very seriously when I went to hundred through hundreds of hours of work, draw two trips up to Montpelier, Barry actually, and, and presentations. Um, but I would say that uh, Wyndham is one of the few schools that made it through this process. We were able to get the other towns to not force us to merge. And uh, I, I feel strongly that if you're gonna move forward on that, that you do it fast. I don't know that there's gonna be language that will prevent what I call the divorces, but um, I, I really, I'm encouraging Grafton and Athens who are about to vote. And I think didn't Westminster already vote to divorce themselves? Yeah, I, I, I strongly support that. And I encourage you to, you know, you know, storm the barricades. I, you know, I, um, it's, it's really maddening. So that's my, that's my two cents, Mike. Before I get too sure. worked up here, go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, I think your, Ruby's question was, is this being pushed? And I would say no. Uh, right now, um, I think all of us have our hands full with COVID and with other things and my, what I'm hearing from the House Education Committee, and I don't have a, a window into the Senate right now, is um, right now they're, they're focusing on COVID. How are the kids doing? Uh, what kind of learning loss are kids experiencing? What kind of emotional situations are rising up because of COVID? Uh, that's one of their main concerns right now. Uh, another one that's just come up is we've had a moratorium on, on, on building uh, bonds uh, to come through the state on, on assistance to schools who wanna, uh, who wanna do repairs or build new schools. And um, that started in 2008. So there's a huge backlog of, of capital expenses that schools are gonna need. And that's something that they're looking at uh, on the front burner right now, because there's a lot of schools that, that are really struggling with uh, with the situations, the physical plants. Um, so I'm not hearing, and, and as, as one of the co-sponsors of, of H-180, that is a bill that would allow, um, I don't see that going anywhere right now. I think it may be something that gets looked at um, in the future, but it, it's, it's, it's not something that's uh, being pressed right now. It's, um, something that I, I haven't heard an urgency to take up this or, or to address the law that's allowing for these votes right now. So um, I think COVID, COVID has really got, a, got us, as it should, the focus is, has been on that and, and how it's affecting kids. So uh, I hope that answers your question. It, it kind of does. I guess I, I... I suppose I've heard what you've said before and I and I hear that it's not being pushed, but I guess that's what was surprising for me when I saw um, that it had relatively recently just, a, you know, a little over a week ago, maybe gone to the education committee as a draft. And I, I, I honestly, it flummoxes me, the online system. I, I mean, I saw that there was a reference that this was now in committee the the one that the law that you or what you proposed but i didn't see a draft of it and so i it 
caused me a little concern because I was like, wait, I thought that this wasn't being considered, but there's something being considered. And I just, and I actually don't really, I trust, I trust you. I just feel like I'm hearing people arguing and throwing things at each other that are very charged. And one of them is now's not the time we've got COVID like this is not a big deal like nobody up in in Montpelier is paying attention to this and then to see that it's there's something that at, is being proposed to the education committee is confusing to me and I don't well, and I, I just want clarity sure I think what happens is uh there's going to be about a thousand bills proposed over the course of the session and we're gonna pass maybe 200 of them. Just because a bill is proposed doesn't mean it's gonna get looked at or passed. And until you see it on a committee's agenda, that's the time when it's gonna get looked at. So um, that's why I'm saying it's not on their agenda right now. I don't see it. Reality is that things can change and situations can change and, um, but right now, like I said, uh, my sense of this, and Michelle, you can weigh in and get your sense too, whether you're, but it, it's not being pushed right now. And, and um, anyway, Michelle, if you wanna weigh in um, on this. I don't have a whole lot to add. I would just say that the situation in Westminster and the situation in the other part of the district feel pretty different. The kind of feedback that I've got from people in Westminster, it was overwhelmingly, we want a divorce. Dummerston feels a lot more nuanced. And so I'm not sure what to say about the future because I haven't been on long enough to, you know, to, to know what's going to happen. But I can say we have way, way more bills than we can look at. And so it doesn't seem very likely that this is going to be one that's going to rise to the top in the next, you know, in the next few weeks before we, um, it'll, if anything, it would be next year that we, before we'd be looking at it is my, is my impression. Mike, can I chime in and, and answer to what Carolyn just said? Yeah, go, go ahead, Jody. Okay. What um Carol, I want to follow up what Carolyn said. Um, I I have been watching the State Board of Education meetings for a long time, and they have been pushing the um, state board, Oliver Olson is one of the big ones to uh, go to the legislature and talk about uh, um, changing the law that already allows us to get out. And starting in, in November, December, going on to January, they formed something and asked their, um, their chair, John Carroll, who was one of the two who voted with us that we should be allowed to, to stay as we are. John Carroll and the um, agency uh, secretary of education have both gone to the legislators to both the education committee senate and representatives and presented that th they should be looking at this so i think we it may not come up this year but i think we have to be very aware that it is on everybody's mind up there that something has to be done and i thank caroline for what she has said she's been a great proponent of, of local school districts thank you Mike, Mike, could I inter interject because I think there's confusion here. There's a, a there's a stand. Every bill that ever gets passed has to be read three times, and what happens is when you introduce a bill, it gets re read a first time and then committed to a committee, and and I think what uh, Ruby's talking about is just the introduction of that bill which maybe you could describe, I saw some chat that they'd like to know what 180 does, H180 sure. does. And, um, and it's just, it's just, you know, reading the first time, putting committee, that does not mean that it's gonna be taken up or passed. It has to be read two more times to make that happen. So sure. thanks. Sure, H180 and, uh, is, a, is a short bill, it's two pages, and basically it allows for uh, the, schools to withdraw uh, from merged, forced mergers. And uh, I know it can be confusing uh, unless you're part of the, the culture of um, the, the legislature, but it, it, there's very, there's many layers something has to go through. 
and it's difficult to get a bill passed. And, and many of us have lots of ideas and that's why you'll see about a thousand proposals for bills, uh, but not that many of them will get passed. So I think, um, I hope that helps. And I see a question now from Molly Stoner. Hi, thanks you guys for having this. Um, before I ask, whoops, I'm trying to get my video to go, but I'm scrolling. Um, before I ask my question, I just did want to make a comment about just process of this meeting because I had my hand up a while ago and some other people jumped in in that time. So just to kind of keep track of order would be really nice. So those of us who haven't spoken yet get a chance. <laughs> Thanks. Um, I guess I, I mo mainly wanted to clarify, I put it in the chat and Mike, you already addressed it, but I, I'm curious because this issue is quite contentious in our in our local school district region. Um, I'm just curious about, and, and, and I'll own that I'm a fourth grade teacher, so I also teach about how bills come to the floor and things like that in, in the Vermont legislature, so I'm partially asking to make sure I can clarify for my nine-year-olds. Um, but uh, so I, I, you know, I hear about the crossover date and about the time that a bill would need to be introduced in order to become legislation for this particular year. Um, and I just want clarity about that because I know that in a meeting on February 12th, a legislator told me that nothing was on the floor or being introduced even. It seems like that's happened in the intervening time. And I'm just curious about timeline because I, I um, am involved in these discussions and I'm concerned about the process mostly. I'm a process person and I'm pretty concerned about the process that happened in our school district particularly during a pandemic. Um, and so I want to make sure that anything I'm communicating, I'm communicating with clarity. So can you guys just educate us and me in particular about that crossover date and how that all works? I can take a stab at it and maybe Mike, you can fill in. Um, cause I'm, I'm learning about this much more thoroughly only recently as well, but my understanding is that in order for a bill to be passed this year, it would need to be voted out of committee and then voted on by the entire house also with an approving vote before it would be sent over on March 12th to the Senate. And usually when you're doing that process, you're hearing an enormous amount of testimony from people on both sides and March 12th is not very far away. So the fact that they haven't put it on their agenda to look at it yet, it seems pretty likely that it is not going to be looked at at all by the committee, much less voted on by the committee or make it to the House to make it to the Senate in time to be voted on. So, so is that accurate, Mike? Could I, uh, I'll chime in here. Crossover, which this year is March 12th. It is, okay, thanks. Is the date by which all policy bills have to be out of their policy committees and onto either the floor or a money committee. Some bills require money, uh, appropriations or taxes fees. Uh, if they require an appropriation, they go to appropriations. If they require a fee or um, some kind of tax, they go to ways and means in our, on our side. On the Senate side, it's um, appropriations and finance committees. So they have to be out of our policy. So if, yeah, so I, we're, us policy folks are under the gun. I need to have all of my bills that I want. And it's, it's not so much to be passed, but to be considered by the other body without a rule suspension. So, so I don't know, maybe I'm getting too far into the weeds, but we need to have our policy bills out by March 12th, and then they have to be out of any of the money committees by the following Friday in order for the Senate to even work on them without a rule suspension. So that's, that's sort of where we're at. Now that means we have two weeks until crossover because we take the town meeting week off, which I'm kind of bummed about, but at any rate. Um, so, so does that make sense to you, Molly? Does that, do you understand? Yeah, it, yeah, I just had one clarification. When you say rule suspension, you mean that somebody would actually say the rules of the legislature need to be suspended in this incident? incident? Well, in, in my case, if I send something over there, now 
I can ask for a rules exemption, uh, but what I found, which was a surprise, uh, an unfortunate surprise, but what I found is that it's the Senate Rules Committee that makes those decisions. And what's what's equal now, and this is something I've just learned in the last several years. So you you learn every something new every year, almost every day. But if you pass something and it goes there after crossover, it goes into their little um, what I call a beady boo, and it, you can't, and it they won't even come out uh, in the next year. They get stuck there. So um, Mike and Michelle, if you don't know that, that's uh, holy smokes. That's that's pretty. So I would rather not not pass something uh, after February twelfth out of my committee and just hold on to it to the following year, unless I can somehow get it into some other bill through an amendment. Wait, when you just said February 12th, did you mean March 12th? That's exactly what I meant. Okay. March 12th, sorry. No, that's fine. <laughs> My fourth graders tell me what I mean instead of what I said all the time. Yeah, yeah, no, the March 12th is the date. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay, thanks so much for your clarity. So it does sound like if there were that, you know, March 12th is kind of a magic date, but if there were a movement in the Senate to ch change some rules, it could potentially in a small chance be looked at after that. Is that fair to it, say? You, that the, the Rules Committee in the Senate could approve uh, letting something out of its little, its little prison <laughs> and, and passed on. And the same okay. thing is in reverse. For the, for the anything that comes from the Senate is under the same scrutiny. Now I will say that if something is really wanted and desired, it will come out. And as I also said, you can find ways sometimes to pass stuff on other bills as an amendment, but they have to be germane. Yeah. Okay. Thank you so much, Molly. Um, yes. Before before I move on to another, did. Did you get your question answered or is there the clarity that you wanted? Oh, no, that was a lot of clarity. Thank you. That was okay. My, my question was mostly about the process. I mean, I have my own personal thoughts and feelings as an educator and um, and a person who likes, you know, process about how this particular process we're referring to has gone, but I don't need to bring that into this meeting. Yep. <laughs> That's a local well, yeah. All right. Well, as a teacher, I want to thank you. Um, you. You all have been doing amazing work through the most difficult of times. And, and for me, whatever happens in education, the bottom line is, how are the kids doing? And, and I'm just amazed at what our teachers have been doing. And I've been talking to teachers from, you know, our our district spans two different supervisory unions. So we've been talking to teachers from a lot of different towns. So I wanna just offer you a big thanks. Well, may I respond? Is that okay in process? <laughs> because I'm process right now. Thank you, Mike, I appreciate that. I am 29 years in and worked 60 to 70 hours all fall because I was you know, teaching two grades suddenly and filling in for you know, lunch and cleaning and everything else. But I guess what I would like to say in regards to that um, is that the way to show that appreciation in the legislature right now is to stand by the promise of our pensions. Um, I feel very strongly that, you know, I didn't have an option of whether or not to contribute to the pension. It was, it was part of my package and it was given to me um, and I pay every year for it. And I, I run, I'm a mathematician, so <laughs> I've been running numbers of, you know, yeah. what if I retired right now, which I can't do. And but here's look like? Can I, let me, but I just want to let, I want people to understand the magnitude for an individual that if there's a 2% cost of living increase and we're held at our um, current level, I would be receiving instead of, instead of 60% of my top three years, I would be receiving 33% of my top three years, um, 30 years into retirement if I were lucky enough to live to 90, you know? Uh, I'd be receiving 42% of my top three years. I would lose, you know, a, depending how long I live, um, hundreds of thousands of dollars that was promised to me that I think is largely related to actuarial changes in the last year and not really 
about real dollars. So that's my yep. little soapbox. I'm off and, it. And and it and it's heard. And and I, and I want yep. you to know that uh, I and many of other of us are very clear that we have to be faithful to those agreements. And it's unfortunate that the headlines are being grabbed by a plan that the treasurer put out that is being seen as a done deal. It is not a done deal. There's a long way to go before we get to the point where decisions are gonna be made. And it's really unfortunate because I like a lot of the work the treasurer has done, but in this instance, I think she jumped out in front in a way that has not been helpful. It's created a lot of fear and confusion and, and I'm sorry about that because you and all the other people that have been paying all this into your pensions for a long time deserve better. So I just wanna reassure you, this is not a done deal what the treasurer has said. And there's a long way to go before we're gonna to get to that point. No, I understand that. And I also just know that the Vermont NEA knows that too. The very first meeting we had as a pension committee, they said exactly that. This is the very beginning. So don't, don't lose faith. I'm not losing faith especially in my particular representative. So thank you all for your advocacy. You bet. All right. So we're, we're getting close to the end, but Jody, did you have a specific question or statement? I just wanted you, you've to- You've had a few times to talk already, so. Yeah, I know, I talk a lot, I'm sorry. Um, unmute. I think it's muted as well. You're muted, Jody. I thought I hit it. Um, there is a companion built, um, Ruby, as to 180, and it's 182. And could you say what that does, Mike? You're muted, Mike. Jody, I don't have it in front of me. Like I said, there's already 400 bills out there. I don't know them all by number, so I could look it up for you and, and uh, get back to you on that if you want. Um, are there any other questions that we've missed before we? Mike, can we just um, go to Jeanette Staley for a minute? She and I had spoken before the meeting and she had an announcement she wanted to make about a racial equity committee that we're hoping to form in the Greater Falls area. Jeanette, are you up for speaking for a couple minutes? Sure. Thanks. Well, I didn't have to, but thanks, Michelle. Um, <clears throat> I'm Jeanette Staley. I'm an artist. I'm in um, North Westminster. And um, Michelle sort of introduced why I am, came to her. But I think um, diversity and inclusion is really important. Um, there's an intersection between what I do in my art practice and um, and and diversity and inclusion. Um, you may have seen the vote out the patriarchy signs all over town the last couple of years. That was me working on my MFA project. Um, and so when this came up, I've been you know, really concerned about it for years and called Michelle hoping that we could um, come together as a community and find a way to address these issues um, of harassing and threatening people, uh, whether they're, it's because of gender or LGBTQ or race, um, in a way that doesn't involve police or legislation, but a kind of in communing. Um, and so on Monday evening at five o'clock, we're gonna have a Zoom meeting to bring people together to start this conversation. Um, Putney has a group that we're gonna have them come and talk to us about what they're doing. Um, our group doesn't have to be just like Putney's. It doesn't have to be as organized, um, but I'm hoping that we can get, get some more people involved. So if you know of anyone, that might be involved, or if you yourself would like to be involved, you can um, contact Michelle would probably be the easiest. Um, also, I, I own Flying Canvas Studio, which is my art business. So if you wanna contact me through that, you can do that. Um, and if you know of anyone too, to please invite them. 
I think that's it. Does anybody have any questions? Yes. No, go ahead. I don't have a question, but I would encourage you to include people with disabilities. Issues of accessibility fall through over and over again. Yes. And it's not addressed in any of these committees. And it's so disappointing. I can't open most doors in Putney. They need a lever and they have a weight should be only 15 pounds. If you take a fish scale and pull on, see if you can pull it open. I, it's, it's totally and absolutely the SEFCA uh, over in Westminster, I cannot open the door. Lovely Ram, mm -hmm. I can't open the door. Um, yep. The e e e exclusion of people with disability, you have to be in a wheelchair. No, we have upper disability. I've got two titanium elbows and plastic knuckles. We do not, uh, we let people with disabilities fall through the cracks over and over again. Mindful of your, com your committee, please. E Eva, thank you. Um, we have a, a racial and social equity caucus in the legislature. And one of the pieces, we have several people uh, who have, th there's another term that's being used. Um, and I, I can't remember it right now. I'll have to ask my, my wife. It's not just disabilities, but we have people who have disabilities who are making sure that when any of these conversations happen uh, about, communities of people that are not being served, that the disabilities rights people are, are right there. Uh, you make a good point, Eva. And, and as many of us age, we're gonna experience that firsthand, what you've been experiencing for a long time. And we need to make sure your voices are there. So we've uh, come to the to the end of our scheduled time, and, and I don't want to cut anybody off if they haven't had a question answered or if anybody hasn't had a chance to talk. So here's your chance. And I want to thank Carolyn Partridge um, for taking time out of her Saturday morning. And uh, Michelle, do you want to close us out here? Sure. Um, I, I don't see any other raised hands. Just a thumbs up from Jody. Thank you for that. Um, yeah, it's nice to have everybody here. If you want to follow up either in terms of the racial equity meeting for Wednesday or anything else, you know, be in touch. Um, you can find us online. State rep representatives all have the same formula for their emails. And I, I'm super happy to hear from people anytime. So is Mike. So is Carolyn, I'm sure. And uh, please let us know what's of a concern to you. It's really helpful when it come time, comes time to vote to have a sense how the people that we're representing are feeling about issues. We have our own issues, but some of the issues, it really makes a difference to know how the majority of the people in our, in our community are feeling in terms of shaping our, our own vision around some issues. So thanks for being in touch. Thanks for coming and we'll see ya. Thanks everybody for the opportunity.